Success in pigeon racing, however, can't be forced, and one good turn deserves another. Luckily, Van Berendonck can count on many helping hands, and that is essential for maintaining perfect hygiene. Mifrau van Berendonk takes on a great deal of the care herself, and the washing up has to glean. Where women handle the pigeons, serious fancying is practiced, and in Schilder, this saying has some truth in it. Vitamins are given regularly to the birds, but only in sparkling clean drinking pots. A pigeon fancier has to move with the times, and the dogma of grain and water belongs to a bygone age. Here, Willie is using a spray which helps fight respiratory infections. When the pigeons return home, they are given a capsule containing an antiseptic to prevent basket infection. Many a fancier's nightmare, adenovirus, or liquid droppings, is also kept at bay here. In pigeon fancying, however, the main thing is to have good birds. Willy van Barendonck made a large investment in Merleman's pigeons and they have performed miracles after cross-breeding with pigeons from Joss Jersen and Piet Manders Janssen pigeons. These beautiful stock lofts also house a treasure chest of breeding stock. The little blue white flight has confirmed once again that investing in top quality birds is still the best formula for success. We're delighted to be able to bring you the next feature, a visit to Itagen and the home of one of the world's most famous pigeon families, the Hubens. Jeff Huben is a pigeon fancier born and bred. His grandfather, at great personal risk, managed to keep eight birds hidden from Hitler's army during the dark days of occupation. To have been caught would have meant certain death. In 1947, Jeff and his father went into partnership. There are many interesting things to learn here, so don't relax too much during this one and keep your eyes peeled. Eitigum could be any one of a number of typical diamond polishing communities, were it not for the Huben family, bringing world renown to this patch of land in the Kempen through pigeon racing. The 1991 season was once again a great success, and since the middle of last season, the Oscar of Merit has stood in between all the cups, certificates and other trophies. It was awarded by the combined sporting press on the occasion of Jeff and Evelyn Huben's golden wedding anniversary. Indeed, no one would deny that the Huben family turned in a stunning season in 1991, with no less than 39 first prizes, including places in the top three, once in the national and twice in provincial competitions, and a fourth place in the national medium distance championship. In the sitting room, we find a mass of evidence showing what the Huben family have achieved in the pigeon fancy through their effort, passion and craftsmanship. The Hubens have a rich Burge tradition, and they have finished 59 times in the first hundred in the national, but it was the chippy which brought the Burge crown to Eitigam. Father Gerard Huben laid the foundations for a career in pigeons which, from the very beginning, gained in momentum. De Goudeblauer, a son of the De Oudeblauer, De Gersgote Divan, her grandsire was the Romeo belonging to De Smet Matthes, De Baron, a genuine top pigeon and son of the Goudeblauer, De Jonger Radio, a son of De Oude Radio, a brother of the Oudeblauer, and De Oude Lichterstan. These pigeons formed the foundation for the successful period in the 1960s. The 70s generation was shaped by top pigeons such as De Jonge Baron, a son of the Baron with the Gascota Divan, 
de artiste, a classy pigeon who made a real name for himself. De Gudesvarten, son of the younger radio with the Lichterstan. Het Gud Daivanica, a granddaughter of the younger radio and Ude Lichterstan. De younger artiste, a son of the artiste and the first. And the Sissy, a daughter of the younger artiste and the Gude Daivanica. The Sony, a wonder boy who made it to second in the national medium distance Ace Pigeon in 1985. The Viking, a nest brother of the Sony and of the same caliber. The Hero, who as a young bird went missing from the loft for two months and later sired the famous Porky. And the Stella, the best hen Jeff Hooban has ever had. The Pigeon newspapers reported the Hooban colony's success in headlines full of superlatives. However, it is obvious that such a marvellous pigeon fancier's career can only be the result of increasing effort and pure craftsmanship. The cock crows at six in the morning at the Huben household. Jeff has the habit of getting stuck into a hearty rasher of bacon before he gets down to work. In his head, he runs through the schedule for the day, and during the racing season, it's usually quite full. Presently, the whole team is sitting round the table. Many reporters and pigeon fanciers have found their way through this narrow entrance in the Heibergstrate into Jeff Huben's sitting room. This early supporter also who made it a point of honor not to miss a single race. My name is Paul Lally, and on behalf of Body and Ridewood, I'd like to welcome you to the Pigeon Channel, and the first in a series of video magazines bringing you the fancy and opportunity to visit the lofts of some of our sport's national and international champions. We're going to discover the secrets of Europe's best, the racing systems, the feeding methods, the health care, the design and the physical attributes necessary to produce a real international champion. So let's start by visiting the Netherlands and the famous brothers Andre and Piet Kuipers, whose superb brick-built double-decker lofts house some of the finest long-distance racing pigeons in modern times. The silhouette of Near Church is well known to pigeon fanciers, and the statue of the farmer's boy with horse has enjoyed fame through the media. In the calm of the little village square, a would-be national football player is practicing his skills on the steps of the church. It is particularly the occupants of number six who have regularly brought this little community in Dutch Limburg into the news, the brothers Andre and Piet Kuipers. It was the 50th Dutch St. Vincent race when their little blue hen added a second national victory to their already rich prize list by triumphing over 43,338 competitors in the first long distance race on the Dutch calendar.
The acquisition of nine pigeons from Jeff Van Van Roy laid the foundation stone of Andre and Pete's stock. The farmer and landowner from Brookhausenwurst carried off, amongst others, the national races from St. Vincent, Barcelona and Marseille. Wedges, Matern, Jan Thelen, Theo Dagen, Sprenkels, Brackhaus, Marraine Van Hale, with a half-sister of Flecchia, have all contributed to the worldwide reputation of this strain. A Van Van Roy, son of Spin, and a Wedges Hen, sister of the Pau winner, became a golden pair for the Kuipers and produced numerous Barcelona champions. The perfect construction of the lofts, built by the Bricklayer brothers, has a great deal to do with their success. The Kuiper brothers go in for long distance racing, both with hens and widowers. The little blue hen was victorious from St. Vincent on the 11th day of incubation. Strange behavior. Once her young were reared, she refused to stay in her box, but preferred to stay on an individual shelf. Who knows what motivated this hen to deliver such a fine performance? We haven't often had the chance of holding such a little bundle of nervous energy in our hands. Is she the epitome of the perfect long-distance pigeon? Her eyes sparkle, but what impresses most about her is the enormous volume of her muscles. No one will be surprised to learn that she also has a very fine wing. This hen of exceptional class went right to the limits of her strength to win, said Andre admiringly. What could be finer than a top-class pigeon which gives it supreme effort. Its father is NL83-1062082. Its grandfather of father's side is B73-2391786. Its grandmother of father's side is NL76-578128. Its mother is NL84-182-8526. Its grandfather of mother's side, NL79-1445731. And its grandmother of mother's side, NL80-1445731. 8009290. During our visit, the widowers were resting at the end of the season. Long distance pigeons had been paired in mid March to rear two young, and were then separated after 10 days of the second incubation. The rearing of some late rounds returned the racing team to normal life. An important detail is the presence of perches actually opposite the nest boxes, both in the widower's loft and that of the pigeons raced on the nest. Every pigeon can claim two pieces of territory. A photograph from 1975, recording the first successes of the loft, is hanging above the door. The heart of the colony beats in the breeder's loft. Andre and Pete are convinced of this. Descendants of their foundation stock have taken up the torch again to enrich the Kuiper strain. The photo of the Barcelona breeding pair holds pride of place in the living room at the side of a chimney breast. 
Here we see the Moda Barcelona, the power winner's sister belonging to the small, fancier wedges. The Veda Barcelona, a pure Jeff Van Van Roy, son of spin. We wanted to visit Brookhausenwurst, where a loft with a worldwide reputation was situated. We found dilapidated lofts and aviaries of the late Jeff Van Van Roy. In days gone by, the best pigeons in Holland were to be found behind this window. They provided the foundations for the Kuiper stock, which is gathered together on this group photograph. The Blauer Divan has her place in the photo. The number of veterans is enjoying a well-deserved rest. Barcelona 2, on number 53 of 1972, had the following results in the Barcelona national race. Winning first, second, 116th, 44th, and 95th. Barcelona 3, number 92 of 1973, did well four years running when he came third, 447th, 54th, and 13th. This is Barcelona 1, number 13 of 1973. Placed third in 1975, he was the national winner from Barcelona in 1976. He has since become one of the best sires in the loft. This is the father of Blauer Divan, who won from St. Vincent. Its mother is the sister of the Barcelona veterans. Out of 11 entries for Barcelona, these aces achieved 11 top prizes. Before we leave, let's lift a veil and reveal a secret. Once the malt is over, the feeding and drinking bowls are removed, and the door is locked for six days. This fast is intentional. It is a way of getting rid of the old down, and at the same time it is a check on the pigeon's degree of resistance. Pigeons which have lost a lot of weight at the end of the week are eliminated without mercy. The Kuiper brothers believe that the long-distance racing pigeon must have adequate reserves available. The Kuiper's system of removing both food and water for six days has many critics, with one leading vet calling it barbarous, dangerous, and useless. Somewhat less controversial, but nonetheless interesting, are the methods used by Marcel Sestelien of Zottergem, winner of the Perpignan International Race. Notice Marcel's interesting breeding system. Having an inbred family, he allows free pairing between all of his pigeons, except for a couple of pairs chosen by himself. French fancier Dessieu and the Germans, Bohm and Runkel Heidkamp, having carried off the first three international victories,
there remained one final opportunity which the Belgians could not let slip. Helped by his assistant, George Sagers, Marcel Castellin, a 72-year-old retired mathematics teacher, took on the task of saving the national honor. Getting back at 6.58 a.m., his 645 recorded 964 meters per minute and carried off the international victory with 10,892 pigeons competing. Daniel van Kerlebroek was among the first to congratulate his former teacher, and he had every reason to do so. The victorious pigeon's grandfather is a van Kerlebroek. Let's take a look at a victor. It is a four-year-old cock which was placed from Chateauroux and Cahors before surpassing itself in the race from Perpignan. This pigeon is from a very varied stock. Delbec, Delbar, Monin, Descamps van Hasten, and Van Kerlebroek. One of its distant great-grandparents on its maternal side came 12th in the Pau International Race, 8th nationally, 6th in the West Sector, and 1st in René Club. The winner's grandfather was bought at Van Kerlebroek's sale in 1981. These are the same lines as the hen which triumphed at Perpignan. Roger Sagers lives and breeds pigeons. Although in his own loft he goes for speed races, he looks after the Castellan long distance stock. This may appear contradictory, but from what we can see, it is perfectly feasible. Let's take a look inside the young pigeon's loft. Wide gaps in the floor mean that in the winter it freezes just as hard inside as out. The inner doors, which are wide open most of the time, encourage the free circulation of fresh air. When they are weaned, the young pigeons spend at least a month in an aviary before their first outing. Nonetheless, the losses are minimal when they are finally let out. Pigeons which are unable to adapt to the Spartan regime at Zottegem are disposed of, rather than being helped by means of powder and pills. Marcel Castellan and Roger Sagers have worked out a feeding scheme for their long-distance pigeons to prepare them for racing once a fortnight. On Saturday, when they return, they have racing mixture to rebuild their depleted reserves. On Sunday, a total fast. On Monday and Tuesday, a feed of barley. On Wednesday, Thursday, Friday and Saturday, a rationed supply of racing mixture. Sunday is again a day of fasting. Finally, on Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday, racing mixture at will until basketing.
Roger Sagers has cut out big, rich grains from the menu and has lightened and reduced the quantity of feed. Barley is a luxury and it is served by the spoonful. A second intervention was just as effective. 20% of the boxes were closed and the population of the loft spread over the available space. This increase in the space for the occupants has led to a higher number of prizes in the results. The winner of the Perpignan race was allowed a few pleasant minutes with his hen. That's the warrior's reward. Marcel Castellan and Roger Sagers found their success increased by the arrival of a second pigeon from Perpignan a little after 1 p.m. They have pigeons from all sorts of origins, but which have blended together. No problems with pairings in the breeding loft. Over the years, the occupants have become related at about every level, and their owner willingly permits free pairing. It is cheering to find a minor fancier at the summit of an international. It is always possible in our sport, and that's all to the good. Next stop is Germany, to the home of Power International race winner Winfried Fetzer, a working man whose system of total widowhood, call it the roundabout system, is widely used in his native country. Hawks abound in rural Rhineland, but Fetzer has his own particular deterrent, as we'll see. And doesn't his winner like peanuts? In the POW race, also known as the elite race, because each fancier may only basket a maximum of five pigeons, the Germans clearly prevailed. Power once again brought forth night flyers and the battle for gold was fought out in neutralization time. To find the international winner, we had to travel to beautiful Saarland, close to Saarbrücken. Ida Uberstein is a provincial town hidden among the gently sloping hills of Rhineland Palatinate. It is known mainly for its fine diamonds which are worn as jewelry. a welder by trade, and in his spare time a DIY enthusiast, is an uncomplicated young man who has to work hard for a living. UEG 31 is the home of the international POW winner. In the same way that he rebuilt his house bit by bit, he built up his pigeon empire loft by loft. Winfried Fetzer accommodates some 45 racing pigeons under his roof, or, in the racing season, around 200 pigeons in total. Two spherical mirrors drive away goshawks and sparrowhawks, which are not afraid to pluck pigeons from the roof during winter. Top quality motivation can often work wonders, and that was yet again confirmed by Fetzer's fine-looking hen. However, the Saarlander readily admits that coincidence has certainly lent a helping hand in the past. The future power winner lost her partner during her early training flights and had to be given a replacement partner. However, the first hen of the stand-in cock was unhappy with this arrangement and would never pass up the opportunity to demand her rights. This used to degenerate into full-blown scuffles during basketing. At the basketing for Pau, the two had once again exchanged a heated word or two, and according to Fetzer, the blue hen drew from this the inspiration for such a marvellous performance. Although the 6055872000 was from a good strain, 
she didn't start out as the favorite. She's descended from the Fetzer's colony's best hen, but didn't follow in her mother's footsteps. Winning a prize was even thought to be asking too much of her, and often she remained left behind for weeks on end while races were taking place. However, Winfried has always been a fancier with endless patience, and he put up with the antics of her loose living without complaint. There were times when he dreamt that one day he would be able to show off her pedigree and qualities. The burning question was always, when? By 1990, her honours list was still blank, and as a sort of punishment, she was only entered in the POW race as the fourth choice pigeon. Winfrey tried to convince himself that it was now or never. Winfried Fetzer had been racing using the natural system, but it had not produced the required results. He decided to use the separation of sexes method after winning the sixth and twelfth prizes at Marseille the previous year against 12,652 pigeons. The cocks and hens are housed in two separate lofts, separated by a sliding door. At basketing time, the door is opened, and the partners flirt with each other for a while before going into the basket. The hens in particular seem to enjoy this method the most, and their performances are in no way inferior to the cocks. Although he is a fanatical fancier, there is not usually enough time left for Winfried to clean out the lofts punctually. This is done at most once a week, although we got the impression that he had missed a turn. The best breeding hen diligently goes on producing offspring for the greater honor and glory of Fetzer's colony. The cock crows very early in the morning, and Winfried doesn't even have time to bid his pigeons good day. In the evenings, however, Every minute of his spare time is reserved for his winged friends, and that can be clearly seen in his rapport between Winfried and his pigeons, both young and old. The bond between fancier and pigeon is undoubtedly the Saarlander's strongest side. Winfried Fetzer's showpiece is naturally his international winner. Her father is a cock belonging to the Belgian Henot, and her mother is one of the hens of a friend called Stichling from Osnabrück. The fact that the pedigree is not overflowing with top names does not worry Fetzer at all. Winfried himself says his hen is as devoted as a dog, and that clearly gives him a great deal of pleasure. She doesn't mind at all demonstrating this for the cameras while eating peanuts. They really make a proud couple, Fetzer and his best hen. Henry Jancis is what the Belgians call a petit amateur, a small fancier who races pigeons to the brick-built lofts that take up much of the space behind his house. The retired Henry, along with his schoolmaster son, Francois, is a long-distance enthusiast. Notice simple nest boxes and a very practical dual-purpose exit and entrance gate easily constructed to fit in a window. His national winner is called Mercator, and you may ask why. Well, if I tell you that one large denomination Belgian banknote carries the picture of the famous Flemish cartographer, perhaps you'll know why. The westerly wind that played into the Germans' hands in the international race from Pau led us once again in the direction of Liège. With their 23rd and 36th places in the international competition, the Jancis father and son team kept Belgian honor high and brought a national victory. Yet 1990 will be entered into the record books as a lean year for Belgium. Henry Jancis, all his working life a post office technician, has always been a great lover of pigeons. The fancy has always come first, 
since this uncomplicated man had never enjoyed any great triumphs. Although he was never likely to lose any sleep over the publicity he was missing out on, his son, Francis, a physical education teacher and also a fervent pigeon fancier, saw things differently, however. He has his own loft at his home, a few doors away, and his own ambition has fanned the flames of his father's enthusiasm. In 1983, they set their hands to the plough together and took the first steps along the road to long-distance racing. The duo bought birds from Paul Tossens in Warsage as a solid foundation for their family. Jancis Senior uses simple lofts. The entrance opening looks very much like a glass pyramid roof, the front of which can be fastened to the back. The long distance flyer dives through this opening of a square meter. The front then falls shut, and as Henry Jancis puts it, they can't escape. That's just what the Mercator did. The convincing national winner shot inside like a rocket through the opening with one of his loft companions hot on his heels. Jancis's pigeons were bubbling with vitality and the racing team were on form. In 1989 they came pretty much into their own at Pau, but this season they have, of course, found no equals. As little medicine as possible, a little fabry, form powder, tea regularly, and as much as they could eat, these are the ingredients necessary to make it possible to see a batch of beautiful flyers circling round the loft. The hero of the hour was, of course, the Mercator. He turned Henry Jancis' peaceful home completely upside down with his success at POW. This cock is a quiet, long-distance athlete who lets all the pressure pass him by without any problem. His predecessors on his sire side can be traced back to the Paul Tossens pigeons, which formed the foundation of the colony. Success and failure, however, are closer to each other than many a fancier would suppose. Henry had sent the national winner to breathe, a 200-kilometer race just three weeks before POW. He was very late back. However, a great deal of work was put into his recuperation, and he was basketed for POW in superb condition. On the morning of Saturday, the 23rd of June, at 7.45 a.m., he repaid his owner's care by winning the Belgian national POW race. Small loft fancier, Henry Jancis' success was shared just as enthusiastically by his family. They were all present to salute the Mercator, the cock that made the Liège suburb of Anne's famous throughout Belgium. Distance continental pigeon fancier, the 1992 Olympic Games were a mere sideshow. The Barcelona International Race attracted tens of thousands of entrants from all over the place. Belgium, Holland, Germany, France, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Luxembourg and Britain. Win it and you're famous forevermore. But first, your pigeon has to get to Barcelona.
international race from Barcelona, the climax of every pigeon racing season, strikes a chord the world over. Thousands of fanciers from the 36 countries affiliated to the International Pigeon Racing Federation stay closely tuned in. As well as the obvious fanciers from the participating nations such as Belgium, the Netherlands, Germany, Britain and Luxembourg, there is also great interest from countries such as Japan, Taiwan, America and Thailand. Barcelona winners are much sought after for export markets and it is certainly no secret that they are worth a small fortune overnight. Five million Belgian francs, or about 85,000 pounds, is no exaggeration. Barcelona fever first strikes the competitors at basketing and the tension increases as the day of the competition approaches. Expectations are high and the long distance racers are prepared for the Spanish classic using all means at the fancier's disposal. The training schedule, motivation, health, condition and above all the intrinsic class of the pigeon are all factors in determining how successful the Barcelona adventure will be. The fancier who brings his pigeon to the start without sufficient preparation won't stand a chance in a race more than 1,000 kilometers long. As well as the two rubber rings they are given, the Barcelona birds are also stamped on the wing. This secret marking is noted along with the ring number and must be quoted when reporting the arrival of the pigeon. Corregum Center does everything possible to combat cheating. The centralization of all the Barcelona birds takes place at Vorst Railway Station, where they are loaded onto the railway wagons. The baskets are arranged in such a way that the free space between the baskets allows these long distance pigeons to be given speedy and reliable attention. Good care is vital for the birds, which have to live in a very confined space for nearly a whole week. The conditions so carefully built up during the preparations could be completely destroyed as a result of nonchalant care. The baskets, around 1,500 of them, are spread over 13 wagons. From the moment the baskets are stacked, care is provided. The 27,167 pigeons brought together here by 8,117 fanciers can now finally depart for Barcelona. A concert of grinding metal and pigeons cooing accompanies the train's departure. The convoy slows down at each station and on Monday at around 4.30 in the afternoon we arrive at the first French station. Every time the train stops, the conveyors take the opportunity to attend to the pigeons. Water troughs in particular need to be refilled, as the rocking of the train automatically empties them. Living with the 2,500 pigeons in each wagon is no cushy number. For four days, the attendants are busy non-stop looking after the birds and they have to snatch what little sleep they can, as they are constantly interrupted by the many stops the train makes. Each wagon has at least one conveyor. Guy Lipke, has been race controller in charge of the Barcelona convoy 
since 1968, the year in which he succeeded his uncle Charles in the job. Every time the train stops, the conveyor's hands are more than full. The pigeons are given fresh water and the wagons are cleaned out. An official of the Royal Belgian Pigeon Racing Federation constantly checks how the journey is going for the pigeons and he pays close attention to every detail. The convoy stops at saint jory near Toulouse. The 11 conveyors get straight to work. As much feeding as possible is done at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, so that the same schedule can be followed for the whole journey. Maize forms the greatest constituent of the mixture, since this is what provides the most energy required for the impending performance. The Barcelona flyers polish off more than 3,000 kilograms of grain during the trip. Fresh, clean water is the elixir of life for a pigeon in transit. The conveyors also profit from the numerous stops by taking the chance to stretch their legs. A council of war is held because everyone wants to do their bit towards making the Barcelona International a perfect race. The weather is glorious. A refreshing beer is followed by a light meal. These oysters taste delicious. It is now Wednesday at about two o'clock in the morning. The convoy pulls into Port Bou, the first stop in Spain. Spanish railways are not the same as the rest of Western Europe. The rail gauge is different, so the Belgian wagons cannot go any further.
after the wagons had been cleaned out and the corn and attendance equipment transferred, Guy Libke negotiates with the local station manager for an extra six wagons to be coupled. The Spanish wagons are smaller than the Belgian ones. In order to guarantee the maximum comfort for the birds, fewer baskets must be stacked into each one. At around 8 o'clock in the morning, a number of station employees arrive to give the supervisors a hand to move the 1,500 odd baskets. At the same time, the condition of the baskets is inspected. housing process takes around four hours. Once the water stocks are replenished and the baskets are in their new positions, the pigeons are attended to for the final leg to Barcelona. You can see just how much the pigeons appreciate a nice fresh drink. The convoy leaves Port Vue behind and heads straight for Barcelona. It is a great comfort to know that the harvest is in full swing in southern and central France. Should the birds be stopped by bad weather, they can buy plenty of food in the fields. Three hours later, the convoy arrives in the heart of Barcelona. This is a part unknown to tourists, Sagrera Good Station. During General Franco's regime, this train was regarded as a military convoy and from the frontier had to carry officers and soldiers. In Barcelona, the soldiers continued to keep guard on the train. This gave the supervisors the chance to go and sleep in a hotel for the night. 
this no longer happens. Now the supervisors stay with the pigeons day and night, right up to the liberation. Taking it in turns, they go for breakfast at the Casa Paco, which has been their headquarters for several years now. It is the only luxury they get throughout the whole Barcelona trip. Thursday is the well-earned rest day for both supervisors and pigeons. Some of them visit the tourist area of Barcelona and try to pick up a souvenir of Spain. Others make use of the break and spend it resting. But even on the rest day, the pigeons have to be given first-class attention. Meanwhile, feverish consultations are taking place between D. Libke and August Tobacco. All the meteorological details are checked out, centralized and interpreted. The international character of this competition gives the people in charge from the most important competing nations the opportunity to express their own opinions on the date and time of liberation. in the morning on Friday, the supervisors begin to unload the baskets. The countdown begins. The entire team waits for the final telephone call from Belgium. Will this be it? The answer from Guy Libke puts everyone out of their misery. Liberate at 8.20. Baskets are stacked on the station platform. Many spectators have arrived. Spanish fanciers don't want to miss this marvelous sight. This Spaniard hasn't missed a Barcelona liberation since 1962. He is understandably proud of the fact. The Guardia don't want to be on our film. The excitement is increasing by the minute. The liberation of more than 27,000 Barcelona flyers is now only minutes away. The last preparations are made and the seals on the baskets are cut.
only 20 seconds now, and the Barcelona racers will be released. Friday morning, 20 past 8, and the 27,000 plus pigeons climb up into the Spanish sky. After a reconnoitering circle above Sagrera station, they immediately head off in the right direction. Among them is the pigeon belonging to Jean-Luc Van Roy from Rance. He will later be crowned international winner of Barcelona, clocked at 6.45 on Saturday morning. Within two minutes, all the birds have disappeared from sight, except for a few that were injured and are handed over to the representatives of the Spanish Federation. Let's pay tribute then to the thousands of nameless birds who return loyally to their lofts over the next few days without honor or glory. They are just as much part of the spectacle of the Barcelona competition, a unique event. For Guy Lidke, it has been yet another successful liberation. The pigeons got away quickly in the right direction. There were few injuries and they're on their way to a fast race. Despite all the difficulties, Barcelona is still the competition that attracts a mass entry. The success of this marathon race is in no small part due to the dedication and dynamism of the team of employees working under the skillful leadership of August de Baca. Early on that Saturday morning, August de Baca is already at his post. His intuition hasn't failed him, and just after seven o'clock, the telephone rings. At 6.45, Luke Van Roy from Rons clocked his Playboy, a lightning-quick bird that will later be declared the international winner of Barcelona. The birds competing in this international event came from the following countries. 11,933 from Belgium, 6,234 from Germany, 8,163 from the Netherlands, 110 from Britain, 1,268 from France, 89 from Luxembourg, and 555 from Poland and Czechoslovakia. The competition had been a fast one, and on Saturday night, with the close of race at 22.28 hours, the race result could be declared. The international winner belonging to Jean-Luc Van Roy covered the 1,000 kilometer plus at an average speed of 1,103 meters per minute.
It is now Wednesday at about two o'clock in the morning. The convoy pulls into Port Bou, the first stop in Spain. Spanish railways are not the same as the rest of Western Europe. The rail gauge is different, so the Belgian wagons cannot go any further. After the wagons have been cleaned out and the corn and attendance equipment transferred, Guy Libke negotiates with the local station manager for an extra six wagons to be coupled. The Spanish wagons are smaller than the Belgian ones. In order to guarantee the maximum comfort for the birds, fewer baskets must be stacked into each one. At around 8 o'clock in the morning, a number of station employees arrive to give the supervisors a hand to move the 1,500 odd baskets. At the same time, the condition of the baskets is inspected. housing process takes around four hours. Once the water stocks are replenished and the baskets are in their new positions, the pigeons are attended to for the final leg to Barcelona. You can see just how much the pigeons appreciate a nice fresh drink.
The convoy leaves Port Boo behind and heads straight for Barcelona. It is a great comfort to know that the harvest is in full swing in southern and central France. Should the birds be stopped by bad weather, they can buy plenty of food in the fields. Three hours later, the convoy arrives in the heart of Barcelona. This is a part unknown to tourists, Sagrera Good Station. During General Franco's regime, this train was regarded as a military convoy and from the frontier had to carry officers and soldiers. In Barcelona, the soldiers continued to keep guard on the train. This gave the supervisors the chance to go and sleep in a hotel for the night. This no longer happens. Now the supervisors stay with the pigeons day and night right up to the liberation. Taking it in turns, they go for breakfast at the Casa Paco which has been their headquarters for several years now. It is the only luxury they get throughout the whole Barcelona trip. Thursday is the well-earned rest day for both supervisors and pigeons. Some of them visit the tourist area of Barcelona and try to pick up a souvenir of Spain. Others make use of the break and spend it resting. But even on the rest day, the pigeons have to be given first-class attention. Meanwhile, feverish consultations are taking place between Guy Libke and August Tabaka. All the meteorological details are checked out, centralized and interpreted. The international character of this competition gives the people in charge from the most important competing nations the opportunity to express their own opinions on the date and time of liberation. in the morning on Friday, the supervisors begin to unload the baskets. The countdown begins. The entire team waits for the final telephone call from Belgium. Will this be it? The answer from Guy Libke puts everyone out of their misery. Liberate at 8.20. 
The baskets are stacked on the station platform. Many spectators have arrived. Spanish fanciers don't want to miss this marvelous sight. This Spaniard hasn't missed a Barcelona liberation since 1962. He is understandably proud of the fact. The Guardia don't want to be on our film. The excitement is increasing by the minute. The liberation of more than 27,000 Barcelona flyers is now only minutes away. The last preparations are made and the seals on the baskets are cut. Only 20 seconds now and the Barcelona racers will be released. Friday morning, 20 past 8, and the 27,000 plus pigeons climb up into the Spanish sky. After a reconnoitering circle above Sierra Station, they immediately head off in the right direction. Among them is the pigeon belonging to Jean-Luc Van Roy from Rance. He will later be crowned international winner of Barcelona, clocked at 6.45 on Saturday morning. Within two minutes, all the birds have disappeared from sight, except for a few that were injured and are handed over to the representatives of the Spanish Federation. Let's pay tribute then to the thousands of nameless birds who return loyally to their lofts over the next few days without honor or glory. They are just as much part of the spectacle of the Barcelona competition, a unique event. For Guy Lipke, it has been yet another successful liberation. The pigeons got away quickly in the right direction. There were few injuries and they're on their way to a fast race. Despite all the difficulties, Barcelona is still the competition that attracts a mass entry. The success of this marathon race is in no small part due to the dedication and dynamism of the team of employees working under the skillful leadership of August de Bacca. Early on that Saturday morning, August de Bacca is already at his post. His intuition hasn't failed him, and just after 7 o'clock, the telephone rings. At 6.45, Luc Van Roy from Rance clocked his Playboy, a lightning-quick bird that will later be declared the international winner of Barcelona. The birds competing in this international event came from the following countries. 11,933 from Belgium, 
6,234 from Germany, 8,163 from the Netherlands, 110 from Britain, 1,268 from France, 89 from Luxembourg, and 555 from Poland and Czechoslovakia. The competition had been a fast one, and on Saturday night, with the close of race at 22.28 hours, the race result could be declared. The international winner belonging to Jean-Luc Van Roy covered the 1,000 km plus at an average speed of 1,103 meters per minute. That really was some spectacle. The international winner was, as you heard, Jean-Luc Van Roy of Reims, Belgium. And yes, you've guessed it, the Pigeon Channel will bring you a special report from Jean-Luc's loft in our video number two. But now we're off to Germany and Darmstadt, to the home of the 1989 winners, the Bone Brothers. You'll never worry again if your favorite has a badly damaged or missing flight. The Bone Brothers international winner had a badly withered flight in each wing and still managed to beat 25,000 other pigeons back from Barcelona. Does any fancier not dream of triumph in the Barcelona race? Contenders become more and more numerous every year. In 1989, it was the brothers Joachim and Manfred Bohm from Darmstadt who carried off the victory. The Bohm brothers have been racing as a team since 1955. Joachim manages the racing loft, while Manfred looks after the breeders. In 1983, they decided to race from both lofts. Manfred's was registered in the names of his children, so the victory had to be celebrated in their names. We went to see the Bohm family as soon as we heard the international winners came from Curragum Center. Manfred was on his way home from the club, where he had been given official confirmation of the supreme success in an already well-honored career. As you can imagine, the atmosphere was euphoric. The victory was achieved by a little checker hen of 1985 vintage, raced under the total widowhood system. In each wing, she has one primary which has regrown poorly, which Manfred puts down to the obligation to vaccinate against paramyxovirus in Germany. This handicap did not prevent her from beating 25,000 competitors. Every year, top buyers from Europe and the Far East try to acquire the winner of the Barcelona International Race. In 1989, the Japanese were successful. Before putting her on a plane, the Bohm brothers have been able to obtain a few young from her. These are the last pictures of the winner in her native country. The father, B3420820 from 83. The grandfather of father side, is B3367878 of 72. The grandmother of father's side is B3212749 of 80. The mother is B3364530 of 83. The grandfather of mother's side is B3172050 of 76. The grandmother of mother's side is B4545476 of 72. The breeding loft is for the best part occupied by pigeons of Belgian origin. Lofts of Robert Venus of Coxseed 
and J.P. Bart of Blankenberg have been the main suppliers. The little Barcelona comes from a Bart father and a Venus mother, both in turn direct products of Belgium. The Bohm brothers practice total widowhood, a very popular system in Germany. After spending a night in the loft in the boxes, the cocks are let out for their morning exercise flight and are then called back in. The hens leave from the compartment with perches and come back into the loft with the boxes where they spend the day shut in the boxes while the cocks are passed through to the compartment with perches. This rotation is the cornerstone of the system. At basketing time, cock and hen can see each other for 20 minutes or so, but mating is forbidden. It is prevented by placing a board with large holes between the two. In Darmstadt, they call that love behind the bars. At the rear of the loft, a tall aviary has been built. In the summer, only the breeding pigeons take the air in it. But in the winter, it is also used for the other pigeons, since it is too risky to allow exercise flights under the vigilant eyes of hawks and sparrowhawks, which are always on the watch. The aviary also displays another detail of the total widowhood system as practiced by the bones. At the time of departure for races, cocks and hens can see each other. An empty box has no attraction for a cock coming home from a race. To remedy this, a few spare young hens kept in a separate compartment in the aviary are made use of. If the accredited hen is not able to receive her cock, one of these understudies is presented and she is only too willing to mate. This little compartment is designed in such a way that the hens are unable to pair together. It is quite mobile, this is handy for letting these hens out. Manfred Bohm is a handyman. For him, repairing a broken primary feather is no problem. Let's watch him demonstrate this. The fine steel shaft of a pin is inserted into the broken feather, coated with a strong adhesive. The new feather is fitted in the same way. Und diese, Sie wissen ja, diese ist jetzt in Taube. Of course, you need to have a stock of left and right feathers. Manfred Bohm's own breeding loft has kept the story going since the Barcelona success. Joachim Bohm's racing loft was the star for many years. In 1978, 79 and 80, the brothers won their section championship against 3,600 members three times. In 1981, they were able to show two pigeons at the Tokyo Olympiad. Later that year, because of work activities, they organized a sale which aroused great interest. Following that sale, they had to prepare a comeback. They had to wait quite a long time before renewing their acquaintance with success with their international victory at Darmstadt. But the Barcelona international result is a victory with a vengeance. Our next visit is to Belgium, and another Barcelona winner, Francois Skellens. Francois is a busy physiotherapist whose lofts are situated behind his parents' house. Francois believes that feeding is the key to success. And being a physiotherapist means that his comments on pigeons' muscles should be really interesting. The Belgian winner of the 1989 Barcelona race was Francois Skellens. This 30-year-old physiotherapist 
has been a pigeon fancier since he was 13 while attending school at Arshot. A stray pigeon which replaced a deceased canary, a suspended cage with three compartments and later on a real loft, and the enthusiastic cooperation of his mother, Josephine. These were the stepping stones in a career which has developed over the years. Although the anti-magnetic parasite box is still the subject of controversy, Françoise is convinced of its benefits. In amid the greenery, it watches over the loft. Françoise Skellens has many clients who keep him very busy. His mother undertakes a major share of the loft management. Yet another loft where the feminine touch leads to success. Francois noticed that hen pigeons in an aviary never had any health problems, so he arranged his widowhood loft in a similar way. In the front are sliding doors that can be opened or closed depending on the weather. Francois attaches great importance to the diet. He has worked out a formula to simplify his mother's work. Each pigeon's feed, which varies from day to day, is packed in individual cups. The feed is served on a spoon. both of the boxes and of the loft itself, are of wire mesh. This ensures hygiene and a reduction in the cleaning chore. The waste accumulated under the floor mesh is removed once a year. The Barcelona winner only needed a small opening to escape and take to the air with powerful wing beats testifying to his intact physical condition. We wanted at any cost to place the winning champion in front of our camera. This wasn't at all hard for Francois Skellens. He has the knack of controlling his pigeons and he only needed to call a few times for the Barcelona pigeon to obey. Communication between master and pigeons certainly exists. The sire of 556, the national winner, is a Janssen descended from the Pörer, the timid one, of 1967 from André Berta of Wilrick. The mother is a Delbert from a fancier friend of the Delbar family. Now we can talk about muscles, because we have a specialist with us. It has been proved in sporting physiotherapy that long muscles enable a more powerful contraction to take place. 